Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining our session here where we will be talking about DSM and uh, the new business climate leader. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, please use the chat and hopefully we will have time for some questions from the audience towards the end. I am Runa Binje. Uh, I'm the communication director for the CCL Action Group Business Climate Leader. And I'm joined here uh, by Hugh Welch, uh, the General Counsel Secretary and President of DSM North America. Welcome, Hugh. Uh, thank you. I think I look uh, a little different than my picture. I have some pandemic hair going on. <laughs> um, Hugh, on behalf of CCL, uh, I would like to thank you for endorsing the ICDA. Uh, for speaking with us today uh, and also for lobbying with us in the next week. Uh, how come climate action is important to you, Hugh? Well, I mean, it's extraordinarily important to me for, for a number of different reasons. Um, I mean, one is, and you may not know, the acronym DSM actually stands for Dutch State Mines. And our company started its history 100 years ago as a coal mining company. And I think because of that original sin, we're a little evangelical now on the issue of climate change. Um, but all kidding aside, I mean, uh, we, we know we have a responsibility to help mitigate the, um, the oncoming climate disaster. Uh, it's not just the right thing to do. It's, um, it's really good for our business as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so today DSM is really a science and innovation company creating game-changing innovation in nutrition and health. Uh, climate and energy and resource and, uh, and circularity. So you basically invest in solution that enables, enables your customers to uh, live more sustainable. Uh, could you tell us about one of your products that you think are unique uh, and might be one of the solutions to climate change? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, one is um, a product we call Bovier and it's, uh, it's, it's, real, it's real name within the company is called Clean Cow. It's a feed additive that we can we can feed to a cow to any other ruminant that redu will reduce methane emissions in that animal by up to 60 percent and most folks by now probably realize that burping cows are not a insignificant emitter of uh, greenhouse gases and so if we just fed this um this clean cow product to all of the ruminants around the world we would we would make a significant impact on on climate change uh we have a whole host of other products as well we spend over a billion dollars a year in research and development and a lot of it's focused on areas where we can uh, we can help our customers improve their own climate footprint. So if these products are sold out in the U.S., we could still eat our beef with go uh, with good confidence, or you can enjoy uh, your beef, your cheese, your milk, and knowing that the uh, the animals are happy and that the products they're producing are are done so with a much less intensive carbon footprint. Wow, that's amazing. So I encourage you all to, to go to dsm.com to read more about the amazing innovation products. It's a true joy and it gives you hope for the future. Uh, but back to your uh, climate initiatives. So your business strategy is aligned with five of the UN uh, sustainability goals. You have a target of being a net zero by 2050. Uh, your targets are validated by the science-based target initiative and aligned with the Paris Agreement. Just to mention some, and, and, and I must say your climate initiatives are really comprehensive and by the book. Uh, so can you just describe a little bit why you decide to transform from mining to the company you are today? What, what happens? Yeah, I mean, if you just think of it in, in, in sort of a car corporate Darwinist sense, if we, had we stayed a coal mining company, we would have gone extinct. Um, we, we evolved from a coal mining company into a petrochemical company. Had we stayed a petrochemical company, we'd have gone extinct. And so ours is a journey of continuous adaptation and evolution to meet the sort of changing needs of the world. And if you had to look somewhere for what is the world's business plan, it would be the sustainable development goals. So yep. to the extent that we can align our portfolio of companies with the sustainable development goals, I think we're gonna survive for another hundred years. Well, that's amazing. So, so but uh, like going, um, uh, moving to the EICDA, so, so typically companies are against tax and fees uh, that, what, uh, that will or might affect their bottom line. So can you just describe a little bit the internal discussion at DSM when deciding whether or not to, to, to lob for a, a price on carbon? And will also the, um, uh, the act uh, um, affect your bottom line in any way? 
Yeah, no, it's a very easy conversation within DSM because we've had an internal yeah. price on carbon for a number of years now. So we have a, a 50 euro a, a ton internal price on carbon that's applied to every large capital project we have, every big mergers and acquisition deal we do. We just we just signed up a new deal yesterday, so a billion dollar deal. So you can imagine that that's not an insignificant internal price on carbon. So it was very easy to um, uh, to have this conversation within DSM to uh, to enable me to uh, to be an advocate for this act. Uh, DSM has lobbied for a price on carbon around the world again, for many years, because we think it's the only way we're going to get that, that catalyst to break the inertia, to lead to new, new innovation, new early adaptation of uh, a cleaner, cleaner technology. And we see that we've seen that within our own company by adopting this price on carbon. We think we'd see that in the larger economy if we did this through the act. Yeah. So, so do you think it will actually be easier for you to sell some of your products if you get uh, this act uh, in force? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly some products uh, that yeah. would be easier to sell. The clean cow product, no, because there's an exemption under the act for agricultural emissions, but that's okay. Maybe down the road, we'll, 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 we'll tackle that one. But we also have businesses that are, um, that are in solar panels, you know, making anti-reflective coatings for solar panels. We make a, um, a carpet that's fully recyclable. That's revolutionary. Uh, carpets today are highly, highly uh, carbon intensive in their manufacturing and always end up in a landfill when they're done with their useful life. We can find a way to make a circular carpet um, where the carpet we produce becomes the feedstock for a new carpet. So there's a lot of opportunity within our own business to, uh, to do well if an, if an act like this is passed. But candidly, in the near term, it probably really represents a cost for us because we haven't moved to 100% renewable energy. So we'll pay a little more, I think, for, for fossil-based energy going forward. But that's a cost I think we're willing to bear for the greater good and for us moving, I think, at, uh, at a quicker pace, as we all know we need to do to mitigate climate change. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, so, so, Hugh, you are a lawyer, uh, and in the coming week, you will be uh, lobbying alongside uh, of CCL volunteers. Why do you think community-based climate advocacy like this is important from your perspective and background? Yeah, I mean, I think that our, our elected officials need to hear from that the whole um, holistic constituency of the population that they serve. So they need to hear from, from the individuals, they need to hear from the NGOs, they need, and they also need to hear from the companies. And so it's very important that individuals talk to their elected officials and explain to them how important legislation like this is to them, not just to, to mitigate climate change, but to do it in a way that enables communities, enables job growth going forward. It's even more important for companies to talk to their legislative officials about this because most companies either oppose legislation like this through their trade associations or don't take a position at all. Our elected officials, senators and congressmen need to hear from the corporations that they're okay with this, that they're willing to pay a little bit more for a more sustainable future, understanding that they're gonna bring new products to market, new business models to market and be able to employ a lot more people. And in the case of a company like DSM, which is Dutch headquartered, makes significant foreign direct investment here in the United States. That's amazing. Uh, what is your expectation of the sessions? What do you think that the dialogue would bring? Yeah, I mean, uh, from past experience, I'm sure they'll be dynamic. Um, yeah. Depending on the point of view of the particular congressperson or senator that you're speaking with, you're going to get a bunch of different types of questions. Um, mm -hmm. On one side, you may hear attacks on capitalism. And, you know, from my perspective, that's not necessarily good. You know, the capitalist system has brought in hundreds of millions of people around the world out of poverty over the last 20 years, employs a lot of different people, is a spark plug for innovation. Um, on the other side of the aisle, you may hear a lot, of, uh, a lot of argument that more regulation is not helpful and that ultimately this could, uh, could create, be, have an anti-competitive effect on U.S. businesses. So you need to be prepared to answer both sides of the aisle. Yep. Uh, on the Republican, on the heart and Republican side, it's really more around having um, uh, border adjustment tax so that we're not putting any U.S. companies at a competitive disadvantage. On the other side of the aisle is, hey, look, we're not going to use climate change as a proxy war on capitalism. And, uh, and we'll see where we come out in the end. Yeah. Have you, been, have you been lobbying for climate legislation before in your career? Uh, uh, yes. I spend a fair amount of time doing that. Really, um, I think, with, with more intensity over the last 10 years. As yeah. it's become a, a more fertile environment, I think, in, in, in Washington to have this kind of conversation, not just with one small subset of elected officials, but today you see the things like the Bipartisan Climate Caucus, 
Um, you would have never seen anything like that uh, even five years ago. So I'm, I'm, I'm more encouraged today than I've ever been. That's good news. Thank you. Um, so we are in the middle of a pandemic and global protest against systematic racism and police violence. Does climate change seems like an important issue to address right now, do you think? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, when we look at the, the issue of the pandemic, and, and first of all, I mean, for me, that's a bit of a test case on what yeah. the climate emergency might look like. And I candidly was kind of encouraged that uh, in some respects that communities were able to pull together to address the pandemic. And at the same time, I was a little discouraged because nations really didn't pull together to address the pandemic. And we're going to need global action if we're going to make any material impact on, on, on climate change going forward. Um, the social unrest in the country has, uh, has been um, heartbreaking. Uh, the underlying uh, cause of systemic racism has to be addressed in this country. I'm hoping that the, the unfortunate events of the last couple of weeks, couple of months, you know, candidly years, um, can serve as catalysts for meaningful change. But it also shows that when there is a, a, an issue that the people all agree on, and I think climate change is, is, is very similar, they'll take to the streets and they'll demand action to see change. And for me, that was encouraging. And it's encouraging that maybe for the first time, some elected officials at a local state and federal level are starting to listen. Hopefully they'll do the same when it comes to climate change. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking because we have a, a lot of volunteers in the audience and, and I guess a lot, of, a lot of them are thinking about, is this really the time to go knocking on companies' doors and start talking about climate change? And you think it's the right time that, you know, they still have this on their agenda. I mean, some of the, a lot of companies are really in crisis management at the, at the moment. Yes. And, and so, so you think still they will have a room for discussion about climate? Uh, I, I do. I mean, I think yeah. that I'm a big advocate that whenever we see um, disruptive change and the pandemic can be, be classified as sort of a disruptive change, yeah. all of those trends that were in place prior to it, don't stop, they accelerate. So we've seen an acceleration of digitization. We're experiencing that together right now. We've seen an acceleration of the work from home practice. Um, issues of sustainability and climate change, I think, which were already um, moving to the front and center, will we'll also begin to accelerate. And I think we'll see more action uh, at a community level, but also at a congressional level. Thank you. So, uh, so if we think about our uh, volunteers in the audience uh, and they're working uh, to find new companies to endorse the act, what do you think are the best arguments for, you know, supporting the ICDA and a price for carbon? What should be their sales pitch when they talk to companies? Um, that if you want to be a company like DSM that was a coal mining <laughs> company and has, has survived and not only survived, thrived over the course of more than a century, uh, yep. This might be might be the type of legislation you want to to endorse. It's um, it's certainly good for the climate. I think more and more businesses are realizing that um, they're engaged more in stakeholder capitalism than shareholder capitalism. And in a stakeholder capitalism context, a company has a responsibility to address issues like climate change. But more and more, even in a shareholder capitalism context, you're seeing more and more shareholder resolutions trying to force companies to uh, meaningfully address the issue of climate change. So both on a principled and pragmatic basis, there's a good argument there. The other is, hey, look, there's a lot of opportunity to come up with new products, new innovation, new business models, um, and hire more people. It's a, there's a, it's a very good business opportunity as well. And if you're not embracing that and embracing that accelerating change, you're going to be left behind to the dustbin of history. That's a very dramatic sales pitch. Yeah. <laughs> So, so the playbook for climate uh, action showcases five pathways for reducing emissions and climate impact. Why is the IACDA the best option of the five, in your yeah. opinion? One is that you have to have a price on carbon. That, is, that levels the competitive playing field. And if you put a price on, uh, in, the, in, in the case of the, uh, the Energy Innovation and uh, Carbon um, Dividend Act, you're, you're putting a price on fossil fuels and leveling the playing field with alternative forms of energy. If you don't do that, it's going to act as a barrier to further investment in, in uh, renewable fuels. Um, the other is that it's, uh, it's not a tax, but a, but a dividend, a fee. I mean, it gets paid back to the people at the consuming level who, who ultimately have paid it, which is great. It's really just a, a, a redistribution of, of some of those carbon costs. 
Um, it'll, it'll certainly reduce healthcare costs in the United States. It'll have a meaningful impact on the health of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And it'll create jobs in this country, good jobs, high paying jobs. Um, you mentioned in your introduction that there are more folks working today in renewable energy than there are in fossil fuels. Let's, let's continue to expand that. Those jobs can't be outsourced overseas. And so I think it, it addresses a lot of the issues, both uh, principled ones and again, pragmatic ones that, um, that should be an easy sell. I don't know why this hasn't been signed into law yet. <laughs> Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Ben, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? I have one so far. You, as, a, as a European company, how do you see carbon pricing implementation in Europe um, really impact uh, lawmaking in the United States? And, and how does it impact uh, how you're thinking about your business model going forward? Yeah, I mean, the Europeans have a bit of a cap and trade system, which, um, which presents some challenges in administration. And I think when I speak to a lot of elected officials in the US, they look to see how the European system is working. And although it's a good start, I think, um, I think we have an opportunity to improve on it. Another area that elected officials have looked at has been the, um, the US Canadian sort of uh, carbon price and cap and trade system that ran through a number of different states here in a number of different Canadian provinces. Um, the one thing though about being a European company that makes this easier is um, you kind of have everybody at hello. So I work for a big Dutch company, three quarters of the country is below sea level. To them, this isn't a theoretical risk. This is an existential risk. And not a hundred years from now, but as sea levels rise and water washes into the, the ports in, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, the people can see you know, what's happening today. So it's, um, I, I, I think it's a story that resonates a little easier in Europe than it does in the US today. But as I said, I think it's, um, it, it, it's, it's becoming much easier to engage with both sides of the aisle here as everybody's beginning to realize that this is a, an issue that we have to tackle together, but it's also an opportunity. Thank you. I think uh, we are moving towards the end of the session. Uh, um, is there any more questions from the audience? I think we can manage one. Uh, here's a good one. What other climate policies would be on the top of your legislative wish list? Oh my. Um, well, look, I mean, I would love to find a way that we can have our dairy farmers um, monetize some of the methane uh, emission reductions from using different products. Um, I'm a big advocate on, on um, renewing some of the tax credits around solar and around biofuels, uh, particularly cellulosic biofuels which have been really, really hamstrung by the current administration and the current administration's uh, willingness to give out, not to get too policy wonky, but give out um, renewable fuel standard exemptions to a lot of the, the oil um, refiners here. So there's a, there's, a, there's a whole host of existing legislation that I would love to see continued, which is currently under threat um, with this administration, uh, in addition to maybe some future legislation around um, dealing with agricultural uh, emissions, uh, methane emissions from animals, but also agricultural emissions related to uh, uh, carbon se sequestration in the soil or, yeah, I can go on, yeah. Thank you, Hugh. Um, now, I would like to thank you uh, for taking you. the time. For I look forward to lobbying with a lot of you next week. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, on a final note and a less formal note, DSM stands for doing something meaningful, as you said, uh, and by lobbying for a price on carbon, you're really doing something meaningful on top of everything else that you do. Uh, companies are extremely important in the US climate advocacy and members and Congress respect the voices of business, as you say. Uh, so on behalf of the CCL and the CCL action team, business climate leaders, thank you. But also thank you to all of the volunteers in the audience. Without you, we would not have been here today. Uh, and if you want to work with companies, please reach out to the business climate leaders and we will help you get going. Uh, take care of yourself uh, and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you all. Have a great day.